which is now that we are in April and our exams are are there in our exams are there in June, first week of June. It means we are left with April and May. You now need, we are now at that juncture where you have to view it like I'm left with eight weeks. If you want to scale it down, you are left with 24 hours of learning, just 24 hours. Because it's 12 hours this, 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 this month, 12 hours next month. So there's now need for you to be a bit serious now. Quite a lot. Now, first things first, I I I have I have also made some inroads in making sure that I usher you into that mode of being serious. I have purchased a question bank for you. It is all that you need, believe you me. You can't say as you say, I purchased a question bank and you have a feeling that you need anything extra. I don't, I don't know. Those who have been passing this particular exam, they've, they've been going through that. So as you say, I've done a lot of housekeeping issues for you. I have purchased a question bank. So here, here it is, allow me to send it to you. You need to practice that question bank. You may not do any other thing like kit and stuff, but not this question bank. I've gone through it and I have realized that those who can only, if you can only practice it and finish it, you never fail. Some of your colleagues, they have used my question banks in earlier modules and they know what I'm talking about. They know what I'm talking about, like, Takura, who is, who is in this particular lecture, I can tell you how vital are these question banks that I'm referring to here. I'm sending the question bank just now. Okay, well, it's, it's open. Whatever is infecting, allow it to finish acting up and it will open. Yes. Okay, so all these notes, I know you have them. Now, SBL notes by Mr. Mpass. If you don't have those notes, you let me know. But I'm sure now everyone else has got those notes. What I want to give you today is the is the question bank. Where, where is it? SBL question bank. SBL question bank. So here you are. This is the SBL question bank from me. say it's like this one is a gift. If we're wondering, if you we were wondering, say, tell me what is it that I need for me to pass the exam? Takura, here you say is again with a holy grail that which you sincerely need for you to pass. So, all you have to do now is to plan your study program with this question bank in mind. You, I would expect you then to, I would then expect you to, what, what, what can I say? I then expect you to make sure that you have the ASBL notes by Mr. Mpasi ready, because the manner in which we prepared those notes is consistent with the questions in this particular question bank. Now, password to open is the same password. You know, our, all our scholar material have a single password. Password to open. To open is 2005 Atlantis Resources 2005 AR. So there you go. So you know what? Under normal circumstances, if you are a nice and 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 a, and a smart student, with these two alone, SBL notes from Mr. Paris and the question bank. These two alone. If, if, if you are con confident with yourself, you can actually write the exam, the SBL exam and pass. But of course, you still need to view some of the lectures that will be posted. So that's the beauty, that's the need why you are in this particular lecture. But I'm, I'm telling you, 
I took my time to do this and I compiled these notes. These notes I typed, like typing. When I mean typing, I'm saying actual typing. 300 pages typing, SBL for you. So don't underestimate that. I gave it all my heart to this. Again, password to open. Is two zero zero five AR. So you now have a package, my notes and the question bank. I've tried to make it relevant and up to date. Why we have this is because we do have vision kits, we do have that, and you may notice that somewhere for exams ending 30 June 2020, for exams ending June, and now of course Kaplan is for exams ending 2021. So I then amassed the strengths of all these question banks. And remember, we also have Africa Study Hub. I also got questions from Afri Africa Study Hub. Those questions which, you know, because as a student, every question to you is ideal. But if I then say I, we have a question bank, it's like, it's like I have confidence. I purchased it from, I need not to tell you who I purchased it from. Otherwise, all you have to know is, please, that don't work. I've done it for you. All you know is to study, practice, and pass, and let us cheer later. Okay. So there you go. That's the housekeeping issues. Continuing with what we're discussing. Let me tell you the broad outline of what we're discussing. We're discussing what is called strategic choices, meaning the actual courses of action which are undertaken by the firm in its pursuit to either achieve competitive advantage or to sustain its competitive advantage, meaning to make the current performance excel in excellent in the long term. That is called sustaining competitive advantage or strategic capability, ability to ensure that current performance is excelled in the long term. Now, this strategic capability meaning the long-term success criteria of the firm is affected by quite a lot. We were discussing quite a lot of things. It's affected by the resources that the firm has, meaning competencies, skills and competencies, the resource base. And we call that the resource-based view to analysis of strategic advantage or strategic position. And again, ability to excel in the long term is affected by how the firm responds to changes in the environment. We call that environmental analysis, and I gave you videos on that. So make sure you're understanding that. Another variable to sustaining strategic position is the issue of the strategic choices, meaning the actual courses of actions that directors pursue in their quest to boost competitive advantage. We call these st a st a st a strategic choices. And these strategic choices, we are analyzing them, and we started last week. We started about growth strategies and we had fun. Play that video, you find it quite a lot, quite informative and quite a lot. And then we, 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 we have what is called, apart from growth strategies, we then, we, then, we then moved on to product strategies. Product strategies. You know, how you excel in the long term is also a function of what are you doing to the products that you have or the business unit strategies? If you are blind on the need to play around with products and make sure that you have got a product scope, meaning the range of products on offer must be of such nature that you don't run the risk of having dry seasons. And I explained that and you liked it. Now, another strategic choice, so I said growth, product, and I also talked about value creation strategies. And that one, I emphasize the fact that money is a measure of value. So as a manager, as a strategic business leader, I don't expect you always to think or always to put your attention on money, always thinking on, of money. Oh, uh, no, no, no. As a strategic business leader, please make sure you get the video on 
last week's lecture, which was about product strategies and value creation strategies. As a strategic business leader, you must have this orientation, meaning really how you perceive money, profitability and stuff. Money is a symptom or a result of doing something right or doing something wrong. In short, there is a positive correlation between the money you are, you, the profit you are earning as a firm and your value-oriented efforts that we are also putting. No wonder why customers say value for money. And that statement of saying we are not getting value for money, that statement is called a goodness or fit test. They are saying what, what, what we are charging us against what we are getting is out of sync with each other. So as a manager, you then have to align value you are creating to customers and the money they are paying. So you do not as, as you shall see, or if, as, you, as I might have mentioned, there is now a global movement towards in, 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 in expanding the scope of our reporting, like integrated reporting. Integrated reporting now requires entities to disclose for shareholder and other stakeholder consumption how the firm links its mission, governance structures, and its value creation processes, and how these are, are going to drive success to the firm in the short, medium, and long term. And I told you that integrated reporting follows a recognition that the firm's strategic success or strategic capability, how it can excel in the long term, is a function of directors being able to discharge their obligations to the various sources of capital. So integrated reporting doesn't view capital only as financial capital. No. You know, when you see me touching my head, it's like, as you say, I have a lot to say. So they are being wired in position. Quite a lot. You don't know it if you're not a, you're a tutor anyway. So let me not explain much. Integrated reporting says managers should not just view um, financial finance as the only capital available to the firm. No. Rather, capital includes even relationships. Are you able to value relationships? Capital includes issues like ecological capital, intellectual capital, manufactured capital. You get that? Social capital, human capital. So why broadening the reporting scope under the integrated reporting framework is to conscientize management to broaden their orientation of what constitutes performance. Because when you are seeing you making money or not having it, don't focus on it. That one is a result. You have to trace, because you know, finance, Success is a cause and effect relationship. There's called dependent variables and independent variables. So profit is a dependent variable, meaning it's a result of driving force. It's, something is driving it. We, we, something is driving and crystallizing itself into profitability. So we shall teach you these even in other subjects like advanced performance management, APM. We shall be teaching you the issues of balanced scorecard. Where you need to analyze that, don't focus on money, recede, and focus on the causes. If you can only divert your attention to causes, you are on a, tra you are on a strategic capability trajectory. In other words, your future is okay. So that was value creation strategy. Make sure you play the videos from last week. If you don't have them, it's you check. I, I, I told you, it's a matter of checking. But of course, when it comes to those videos, they are a bit edited. Some of the stuff you will not get. Like if I send something in that particular video, you will not get it. But still, for you to get that, you then have to join the class, of course. You, that, that's the only way. So uh, for you guys who have joined, your colleagues who send, whenever you will play a video and you realize I sent something, ask your colleagues in our WhatsApp group. They will again send that video direct to our class group this SBL class group here. So you can still get it from there. Now continuing, we now want to focus on competitive strategies. Competitive strategies. I write that as a I write that as a as a as a as a new subtopic under strategic choices. Competitive strategies. 
Some call them business unit strategies. Open bracket and say business unit strategies. Competitive strategies or business unit strategies. Write this. Um, these are strategies which helps the business unit to excel in the market in which it operates. These are strategies which are meant to enable the business unit to excel. They are meant to enable the business unit to excel in the market in which it operates. That's competitive strategies. <clears throat> How, how are you like doing it in that particular market in which you are operating? <laughs> Quite fantastic stuff. You, 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 you. Uh, let me, let me have, the, you know, there's, there's what is called disclaimer. I'm teaching you this, but as for me, you're said to be telling you myself from, from my heart. As you say, I, 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 I really don't believe in competition. No, but I believe in creation. If you if you put value creation strategies here and competitive strategies here, you will see my inclination pivoting towards value creation away from competition. Though value competition in 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 has got some of the elements of value creation, but I'm I'm more in favor of creation, not competition. Because you, when you are growing by competition, competition ushers you in in an, in an, in a, in a, in, a, in a mindset where you are stepping on top of people, on top of you are stepping on top of others for you to get the market, for you to do this. That's competition. I, I, was I able to beat them? Was I able to? Now, when as for me, when I'm doing whatever I do, I actually I'm telling you some of the secrets. <laughs> Is why if you if you want to understand how is it Atlantis is able to excel yeah, under 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 these conditions we have this motto as a company that we believe in creation only if we can create value to a customer we know that we will get customer we we don't believe in 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 strenuous over the board advertising and a lot of other things no we all we simply do is. Are we creating value? Because we realized that there is a direct relationship between value created and the customers or the profit you make. And I'm teaching you as a manager for that. And because you chose me, I then have to persuade you to pivot towards value creation. You will never go wrong. Competition frustrates. Competition frustrates. If you realize you can market things on Facebook, on websites, in newspapers, and you don't get a customer. And then you wonder, is it spiritual? In, you know, in Africa, we begin to sponsor a lot of discourses. No, no, get it from your faith. Money is a measure of value, meaning money responds to the value you have created. So your attention should be on value created. Always make sure that. Always make sure that. Okay, it was a disclaimer, but allow me to teach you about competitive strategies. They are equally good. Remember, they are equally good. It's a school of thought. They are generic competitive strategies, according to Michael Porter. You know, Porter is, is, is a strategic management guru. It's, it's, it's my reference point to a lot of, in, 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 in a lot of what I do. Porter is a, is, is, is a professor when it comes to marketing intelligence, how to position your company strategically in the market, Porter is a professor in that area. So according to Michael Porter, he proposed three main generic strategies. When we say generic, we are saying they, get, they give us the boundaries in our line of thinking, and then we particularize within each boundary. So I'm going to, I'm going to discuss this with you. Right, this they include they include they include one 
one, they include a product differentiation, product differentiation, differentiation uh, two, low cost leadership, low cost leadership, low cost leadership. Um, focus strategy. Focus strategy. Now, now they are quite. There are now other other strategies like four. No freeze. No freeze uh, strategy. No freeze strategy. Then five. It is five. There is. Uh, there is hybrid. You know, hybrid is a combination of hybrid, meaning combination of n of the above. Combination of any of the above. Combination of any of the above. N of the above. All right. So there you go. Right. So that these are the generic strategies which Michael Porter proposes. So let me bring you up to speed once again. I said competitive strategies are strategies which are meant to enable the business unit to excel in the market segment in which it operates. No wonder why we at times call them business unit strategies. So if you if if you don't know what a business unit is, allow me to 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 give you an example. Let's take for in for example Insco. Insco has got quite a lot of divisions or subsidiaries under it. Insco is the parent company for Surface, that company which manufacture cooking oil. I'm just saying what I know. There are others. Ivins. They are under Insco. Cocom, TV sales and, and home, the Simbisa, Sambisa brands, whatever I call these ones, which manufacture chicken in it, Baker Sin, Sambisa, Sambisa brands, they're under in school. Pro brands, it's under in school. No, can you imagine? Quite a lot. Others, they know quite a lot of other companies which are under in school, which I don't even know. But still, all these are in separate business sectors. So we call them strategic business units. How TV sales at home competes in the high-tech electronics market is different from how Ivins poultry, that's for chicken and eggs, competes in that poultry farm market. We can't have a one-size-fits-all approach amongst all the business units which are under COCO, uh, under, under uh, INSCO. No. So we, we, you can now see that business unit strategies, they, they differ depending on the market segment in which a company operates. So we, we, these are the ones we are going to explore now. Well, we won't take much in explore because I know you know what I'm talking about. So I won't, I won't overdo it. I simplify it. Product differentiation, right there? Product differentiation. say this is this this is a competitive strategy which is made, meant to make the firm's product and the, the firm's product product differentiation this is a competitive strategy which is meant to make the firm's product unique and preemptive it's a competitive strategy which is meant to make the firm's product unique and preemptive in its chosen market segment. You get that? It's meant to make the firm's product unique and preemptive in its chosen market segment. Now, what do we mean by unique? When you are when when you are when you want to 
differentiate your product, make it unique. Unique is an element of rarity and robustness. Rarity and uh, it's, a, it's an element of rarity or a unique selling point. Selling that attribute which can that uh, which can only be attributable to your product. That's uniqueness. Try to do that, and then there is an element of re of of preemptive, difficult to copy. Preemptive, preemptive. You 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 hear governments saying they want to give it a preemptive strike. When you are struck preemptively, it means it's very difficult to retaliate. It's very difficult to copy. So preemptive strike involves decapitalization. You know, when we want to hit our competitor, I remember this is now competition. We want to hit our competitor in a preemptive fashion. We are saying once we are there, there will be very, it will be very difficult to copy. That's, that's preemptive. So preemptive meaning robustness. Robustness or difficult to copy. to copy so there are various ways you can achieve these two you know product if you want to pursue product differentiation so how to achieve how to differentiate products how, actually how to achieve product differentiation pd let's say how to achieve pd for product differentiation quite a lot of things that you can do there remember i have given you notes SBL notes by Mr. Mpasi. These are the notes I am explaining. So these are like jot downs. These are not the actual notes. I have already prepared notes for you. So I'm going through those notes explaining to you. But those who know how Mr. Mpasi teaches, they know I don't teach topically. I, I, I'm not the teacher who teaches like, we are on topic number seven, topic number eight, topic number nine. That is called topical way to learning. I'm yet to see a student who passes the exam when you are learning like that. What we do is called the synthesis. That is an approach we use here. We take all the topics at a glance and in our explanation, we bring down a lot of things at once so that you are wired to speak as a manager. That's number one. Number two, you can comprehend and apply everything that we have taught you into a business case and present it in a manner which convicts directors to act. That is called synthesizing knowledge, bringing knowledge to productive use. So it's not like when, when you are playing the video and say, which, at which topic are we? Because in this particular lecture alone, what I have said here covers around six topics at once. Around six. So you can't it is these videos you must play. This if you can, you can only play these videos and get to the exam after doing the question bank. These videos do the question bank to the exam, but because I have gave you detailed notes, those notes now are as they, they cover every syllabus area because I made an effort not to overlook anything in those notes. But explanation clearly, I can't go one by one. No, I just, but you know jumpstart everything and jumpstarting is a clever way of making a vehicle start when it is already in gear number two or three it's a phenomenon that i like when something is being jumpstarted it, it starts having started you know that kind of thing okay so <clears throat> how to achieve pd you can you can invest invest in r d research and development that's another way and then Another way is patents, copyright, you know, if you have got patents, copyright, these are legal, these are, these are, these are legal ways, patents and copyrights are legal ways of differentiating. In other words, though your products can be copied, but they are potential litigation to anyone who imitates your product. You get that? Patents and copyrights. And another thing is innovation.
innovation. So these are the basic ways we know this. That's the ways we achieve product differentiation. So an examiner normally doesn't say product differentiation. Can just tell you that the firm's success has been based on A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. You can tell that are these characteristics of a firm pursuing differentiation or not. You can tell. Innovation actually serves as a competitive strategy. Innovation also serves as a value creation strategy. So no wonder why I said competitive strategies, they embrace value creation strategies like innovation. Innovation is also a, a resource if you are able to do it better. If you are able to come up with new, that element of being able to come up with new is a resource. You know, if, if I am able to innovate, I have a resource that should you copy me, I just come up with something new. It's a resource on its own, innovation. And it also gives me a first mover advantage, which is vital in strategic uh, product positioning. If you want your position to be perceived favorably by customers in the market, normally it's a function of innovation. That one is a function. If, if you innovate, your customers will begin to associate with you in terms of certain trades. We all know that iPhone may, may perform similar functions to Samsung and stuff, but you know but that when it comes to innovation, they have got a one notch ahead of, of, the, of the others. They are one notch ahead. So if, if anyone has got an iPhone, even if you've got a brand new Samsung, do you know that there's brand new latest Samsung and someone has got iPhone S6 or S5, I don't know, those early iPhones. You do notice the fact that a person produces an iPhone, you feel like you have an inferior, inferiority, that inferiority complex. It's unconscious, but you know. You don't tell people, but you feel like you, st you still have a junior phone. That, that a psychological issue is an issue of what you call product positioning. That, it's, an, it's a latent issue. It's hidden. Customers perceive it that way. They perceive it that way. You get it? Talking of, talking of iPhone, I'm sure it's now time I have to, I need to have one. I'm tired of these who are, who are, you know, they've got funny, funny names. Who are, who are way, you know, what's, what the heck is that? I, it, 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 I will make an effort to get one of that. I have praised it, as you can see, so I need one. Okay, so there you go. Uh, then another is local leadership. Low cost leadership. Low cost leadership. That's number two. Now, low cost leadership. This is where the firm aims to be a low cost leader in its chosen market segment. Firm aims to be a low cost leader. It's chosen. In its chosen market or segments, chosen market slash segments. It can be a segment or segment with an S like that. That's low cost leader. So 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 low cost leader. It's it's, it's a source of advantage. And never mind, there are certain businesses even its strategy. China is a philosopher of low cost leadership. Global dominance. Why China is, is enjoying global dominance and is accelerating its pace of catching up with the US to the, to the point of even beating it? If, if you put politics away, chances are US might, it might be lagging behind China. Take off politics and objectively and assess. Why is it China is on such an unprecedented and unbeaten trajectory? The issue is. China has a philosophy of saying everything can be obtained by middle class population. China has no philosophy of, of, of capitalists where those with money can possess things. China has a philosophy of saying 
A private jet can be obtained by a tutor, by a teacher. But that's a starting point. That is baseline understanding when it comes to cost of production and pricing. It's a philosophy in China that there is, there, there is no, no other way. They call it socialism. They, 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 communism, socialism. It's a, it's a direct rival to capitalism. Capitalism says society must be in classes. And there are certain items which a particular class will never get. That's now it odds with socialism or communism. I'm not saying any either of the two is better, but I'm a neutral observer and a commentator. I'm just saying. Uh, you can now see now that the motto of China over the past 20 years has transformed China from a poor country. It was a poor, least developed country to a developed country. And they are not even keen. They, are, they don't drive joy of being said they are developed. They want to be told, to be, to be fed to a developing. Because we, who knows where they want to get. So they have got, in everything, what they have, most of the companies in China are owned by the Communist Party. So as the, their operation philosophy, or you can't be a director of a, a company, in China, which is owned by the Communist Party, if you don't demonstrate sustainably the sources of cost efficiencies that you are going to pursue, they they prime your competence on your ability to reduce costs over time. That is the very hallmark which can make you a CEO, not of maintaining the status quo. Because of that, it now it odds with capitalism. Capitalism primes on the rich getting richer, the poor getting poor, and that dichotomy of income inequalities, where those with money can then play divide and rule with, to those without money, and you, they let you to fight on your own, and they conquer you in so doing. Now in China, it's different. I'm explaining the 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 memeti, why it it, it 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 rose to prominence like that China in a space of 20 years. That is at national level, but that philosophy is also ushered amongst companies in China. Amongst companies in China, they have it to the extent that global corporations like iPhone, Apple, they, are, they have relocated their, their manufacturing divisions to China. General Motors, their manufacturing divisions to China, you know. Most companies, they, they have got head offices in other countries, but manufacturing operations are in China. One may say there's a great deal of labor exploitation, like there's a talk of Uyghur Muslims who are being battled in, in concentration camps, they allege. And they are saying these Muslims in China, they are not wanted, they are persona non gratis there, so they battle them in concentration camps and exploit them for cheap labor. That is what they are saying. Can we take a conspiracy, a conspiracy theory? We don't know. But in final analysis, Chinese products are cheap. So what are the sources of cost efficiencies that you can employ? So here are the sources of cost efficiencies. Sources of cost efficiencies. Cost efficiencies. Are you, are you not seeing, I'm not talking to you as a student, but as a manager. Make, make, make it a point. When I'm teaching you, I will never teach you like a student. So if you want my language to tone it down, I will do that when I'm teaching students. But as for you, you are managers. All right? Sources of cost efficiencies. There is learning curve effect. You still remember learning curve effect? Learning curve effect, if any. Learning curve is an acknowledgement that as employees are performing repetitive tasks, the labor time taken to perform certain tasks you know, decreases. That's learning curve effect. As employees are performing certain tasks, the labor time, are, are performing labor intensive and repetitive tasks, the time taken to produce successive units decreases. So that is a learning curve. When the labor time is decreasing, we say you are benefiting from learning effect, but it decreases up to a certain point. Thereafter, it ceases to, to decrease. So we say there's a point when you are no longer ex experiencing learning curve. No wonder why I'm saying if any, meaning if, if you are still in the learning phase. You get that? 
Another is innovation. Innovation. That's another source of, of cost efficiencies. We call it working smarter. Working smarter or, or introducing technology. Introducing technology. That's innovation. Working smarter or introducing technology. It's a source of cost efficiency. You know, there are things where you, you, put, you keep yourself busy for no reason. One of the ways which keeps yourself busy to the extent of killing you or to the extent of making you irrelevant to this generation is the issue of failing to embrace technology. If you fail to embrace technology and close your eyes, figure it out whether you are relevant or not. You must always be clamoring to, 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 to embrace technology. Why? Not this ACCA. ACCA is able to teach the globe. You, if they want you to be ACCA members, you should copy the profession here. Yeah. ACCA offers this education globally, but they just have small offices there and regional offices. But notice, you don't frequently visit. They, they've digitalized their lending, pla their lending platforms, meaning you can access it on a digital platform. And now imagine the enormous benefits which the profession, the association gets. Reduce the costs, increase the capabilities, meaning capability, what they couldn't do without technology, they are now able to do it, meaning outreach. The scope of customers they can, they can save, they can attend to, it has since increased. Competitive advantage. One is now saying, I, I would like to, to, to have exams with ACC because a lot of things. Their exams are now CBE, their material is easily available online. I'm always on my smartphone, so I can't have a situation where I throw my, my, smart, my smartphone down for me to read a textbook. I can still have my application on the smartphone and still continue to read. That's convenience, that's competitive advantage, that's even customer service. It increases. There's plenty of now self-service features. You can even complete this profession without visiting your, lo your local ACCA office. And what name is given to that? It's called digitalizing your platforms, meaning your learning, deplatforming from brick and mortar, from these walls, and make sure you can accessible. You are accessible by a customer all over the world, independently of the customer's location. You get that? And you save a lot of costs. You save. You know, when when, when we were doing it face to face, I would need fuel. I would need chalk. I would need chalks, I would need quite a lot of things. But now I can, I can just do it like this. Though we are still on a face-to-face -face model, of course, with some courses, but for certain selected classes like yours, you'll notice how you are enjoying these lectures on a digital model. So that is what you should harness going forward. That is what, you, as for me, I don't think I'll be a friend or with someone who doesn't even think like WhatsApp Suppose I say, can you give me your WhatsApp number? And you say, I don't have. Uh, I don't think I can associate with you any longer. Unless you are my relative, of course, I, I will not have a choice. How on, in this era you, you can function for two hours, three hours, even four, without a WhatsApp? So what are you doing? Even businesses, you know, there was a biz, the businesses, there was that, uh, uh, you know, the traditional old model of saying, you send email, we then open emails, we then, you know, the email, the corporate emails like tiriwavi at, at ofcom, ofcom dot org, whatever. So emails would come and, but nowadays companies are now having a dedicated WhatsApp line because the, the, you know, the customer base is changing. They are now having a dedicated active Get in touch with us, interactive platform, platform embedded on their website, meaning they are recognizing that customers even, take for example, Zor, take for example, DSTV. Imagine how engaging they are with customers. You can actually send WhatsApp message thinking that you are talking to a person, yet it's digitalized. It, it will be like welcome. It, it even calls you by name, yet it's a WhatsApp message. 
enter your smart card if it's a dstv enter your smart card number so you feel like engaged they are talking to a person yet it's a digitalized line with configurations for frequently asked questions and standardized and put on a digital platform and imagine how happy customers are this is what we should be thinking how best can we do such a thing and like a situation where we are best thinking how best can we revert to face to face no in in in, in the uk i'm told of late there are certain businesses like british airways british airways they what they do what they what they do now they have got qr scan they have the scan code you remember the qr scan that thing this box thing with which which you can scan with the picture that's the qr for you to enter the aeroplane you they use that you scan because of covid they have made investments in all that if you need food in the plane from the kitchen all you do is you scan once you scan once you scan so the scan for the canteen it will be you know the main seats are arranged i'm talking of an economic class uh, economic class the main so you get the, the the scan for the canteen is just behind the seat so you can take a picture and immediately the menu the menu or the canteen menu shows up you pick whatever you pick there as as for us who drink we pick also the drink <laughs> as for you i don't want you to ask which one we also pick and then before we know it is delivered now imagine that is called internet of things that is called internet of things in other in other facilities they've now implemented robotics no individual can a robot will bring you food and give it to you so the, imagine the remarkable decrease in costs the remarkable decrease in costs that you ensure you know these things i have dedicated topics for this let me not overdo it another source of cost efficiency is so i said innovation like working smarter eg introducing technology and i've explained what i mean by this so so various other sources of cost efficiencies like economies of scale economies of scale you know that element of you in growing in scope and in size so that you can get some of the things cheaper like buying in bulk it doing a lot of other things obtaining loans at lower interest rates etc and there are also what is called managerial economies as the business grows it is able to attract qualified workers no quali most qualified workers they don't they don't want to work in insider systems they call it my business and i'm seeing in our show not the vernacular they they call them insider systems so another source of cost efficiency is the fact that as you grow you are able to attract qualified employees and they bring their knowledge and competences which can do which can go a long way in enabling you to reduce costs so um, the, remember economies economies they are economies of scale like cost economies there's also technical economies like the ones i'm just saying ability to attract qualified personnel or even ability as you grow in size that element of being able to to reduce fixed cost per unit because as fixed cost will remain the same so as you grow in size you reduce those fixed costs per unit and it's a source of cost efficiency and then low cost leadership i mean focus sorry focus focus is when you concentrate marketing effort in a single market segment concentrating marketing efforts concentrating marketing marketing efforts single market segment market segment that's a focused strategy quite a lot of uh, these strategies we have them excuse me of the spellings that i'm writing here i've never seen them in my life single effort all right so there you go 
effort, sorry. So in a single market segment, that's focus. We do have businesses which pursue these strategies and they are having fun. They are having remarkable success. We do have Shangri-La restaurant. It's a long enterprise road, you know? As you approach the CPT there, Shangri-La restaurant. Oh, well, nowadays, it's no longer enterprise road. It's now Amazon Dambuzum Nanga Gwarot. It's, it's, it's a long Amazon Dambuzum Nanga Gwarot. You know, that's how we name these roads. Right? And, and let me not talk about naming of roads, but that's the new name of the road. It was once enterprise. Now, if you, if you get to Shangri-La, um, if you get to Shangri-La uh, restaurant, you notice they, they specialize in Chinese cuisine. Or Chinese or South Asian cuisines, quite a lot. The place is fully packed, and you, you, if if you want to take it to to just pass by, you you get the shock of your life. They will be busy serving frog stew, frog roast, and rice, frogs and noodles. What the heck is that? I once passed I once passed it through the, that place and. Yeah, <laughs> I was passed through that place and I was soaked. I, I, they were roasting beef as well amongst the these stews I've, I've just alluded to. And I said, I need beef roast and salsa, of course. Before I knew it, the person just picked the same spoon or whatever they call it to pick meat from this frog stew bowel right onto my beef and I said, wow, what the, what the heck is that? <clears throat> the bottom line is, jokes aside, they are making inroads from focus strategy. The place is overbooked on a daily basis. Why? That's focus. The beauty of focusing on a market, on a, on a single market segment is like this. You know, we do have two approaches to how we view entering into markets or market. There's what is called mass marketing approach, where you have one size fits all when you are selling things like cooking oil. Cooking oil is like basic. Basics normally they go, if, if you are a firm who supply, which supplies basic commodities, it, it will be prudent for you to go for a mass marketing approach. And you can equally be competitive in that because when, when customers are buying cooking oil, for example, they just buy like millimil, sugar. They just buy these. So you can't say, I want to have my sugar in market segment in this. No, no. That is called mass market. So mass market is broad. Now let us zero it in. There is, called, there is what is called segment approach. Segment marketing approach means you break down the mass market into separate segments. And then you come up with a unique marketing approach in each segment. We call it a segment approach to marketing. You get that? And you further narrow it down. Remember, it was broad segment. And now the last one is called focus. When it now it becomes a single segment. That's a focus approach. So focus is like you you tend to develop intimate knowledge with the segment you are or you are you are, you are serving. That's an intimate relationship with your customers. Actually, there's an extreme form of focusing which is called micro approach. Micro meaning you you escalate it you from being a segment from being a segment into a person. To say I am serving this person. And not like this segment, but this person. It is done normally in customers where they, you know, there is a barber shop for Bill Gates. One person can just say, I am the barber for Jeff Bezos. I am the barber, what called barber man, barber, I don't know, the person who cuts the hair. I'm the barber for Jay Z. Yes, you know, especially those who make fashions. You do you know someone survived just by making dresses for Michelle Obama. Someone is surviving just by making dresses to one person, like Jill Biden, the the wife of of Joe Biden. 
There are markets like that where you can micro manage. So that one, but that we well, let us put that aside anyway. Let us now focus on focus on focus, meaning on a single segment, not person this time, because the, on this part of the world it's not that it's not that. Now micro is you'll be you'll be you'll be making dresses just for five persons, and you you have a company for that. A company, not 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 like an, as an individual, a company employing employees, people to make these dresses. Why? You realize that they are called trend setters. Certain certain individuals within a segment are called trend setters. If you can only supply a T-shirt, for example, to Jay Z, you know he has got seventy-two million followers. When he's putting on that t-shirt with your logo there, that's it. Boom. That becomes your market segment. You have focused, but you have managed the focus on a micro level. You get that? Well, you know, we are talking strategic business leadership here. So give me a, a don't don't say say it appears you are busy giving us examples. You you will never learn SBL without knowing what you are saying in a business sense doesn't it doesn't work that way you are you are on a wrong footing if you are see, if you are busy browsing pages and say say where now are we no 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 that's not that's not sbo you can do that in other subjects like audit yeah audit you can do that say i'm doing audit planning and the risk so you need to do audit planning and the risk not with sbo we talk of business and business we have to say it out to you in a manner that you can break it that you can make that you can say, ah, oh, well, what say is saying sensible. Okay. So that segment. Now, for you to understand a segment, let us define a segment. Because you may say, oh, say has told me about segment marketing. <laughs> it would make a lot of sense if I start doing it now. Not all segments are market segments in a commercial sense, meaning in a business sense, in a manner which we can drive growth meaningful growth and profitability no segment a segment for it to be a segment it must be accessible of course you have to be it has to be accessible and nowadays due to digitalization of our platforms that is that is increasingly becoming not an issue because accessibility you can access it's like for my cfa let my cfa i do have students who are all in the usa you notice that, but I'm here in Zimbabwe, so accessibility, it was an issue then, but now it's no longer an issue. So the, the other issue is um, it has to be tangible, meaning the size of the segment must be meaningful, so that if you bring it to us as directors, we, we, can, we can say you are talking something meaningful. It, might, it has to be tangible, size-wise. Meaning the revenue you are getting from that segment must be meaningful as a percentage of total revenue. You can't say I have a segment which is giving you 2% of your revenue and say I'm, I'm operating, I'm focusing on this particular segment. It's not a tangible segment. And then it has to be, I said, accessible, tangible, profitable as well. That is, that is logical. And it must be sustainable as a segment, meaning there must be barriers of some sort. For others to enter there must be barriers of some sort for others to enter and within each segment if you want to benefit from focusing you do what is called customer profitability analysis because you know or segment profitability analysis but if at micro level that level i alluded to earlier you can actually have what is called customer profitability analysis there are people who benefited from what I'm saying? You know, there's Garway Lodge there along, you know, before COVID lockdown, those were like four star restaurants in the neighborhood. What, how they come, they, be, they, be, they come to be known is they would call like Philip Chiangwa and say, Mr. Chiangwa, we, can we, we have prepared Sada and Turo here and we know you're a traditional man. Can you come to for this particular delicacy with friends, three friends of yours or what? But we if if you don't mind, boss, we will be take we will perhaps take pictures of your dinner table, you included, 
and a little marketing. So as soon as those who follow Chiangwa as, as the rules, who and rules of the city, as soon as they get to know that, they because he's a trend setter, they will then say, oh, he eats at Garwe Lodge, so I'm also going to wait Chiangwa eats. And before you know it, the place is overbooked. It's the place is every they, 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 they are they are already in the league of them of they of, of, of themselves. So you have that. We call that segment marketing or focus strategy. Uh, you, you do notice after saying it, even if we give you a question in whatever form you can answer it. That's the beauty of describing what, what I'm talking about. And then there is no freeze pricing strategy. No freeze pricing strategy. Pricing strategy. Right? You know, no freeze pricing strategy. In Zimbabwe, we have a we have a better term, if you don't, if you may allow me to say it. In Zimbabwe, we call it mushika shika. I don't know where the heck they got that. Mushika shika. I'm sure it, it has got South Africa, South African connotation. I'm sure it came from that and passed through Blauai until it proliferated into the rest of Zimbabwe. That's no frills. Certain businesses, they allow an element of charging a low price for a product with low added features, low quality perception. That is called no frills. Shika Shika. Yes, you know we had that that Africa jet. I don't know where it is now. It would cost forty five dollars from Harare to Victoria Falls, where Pathfinder, meaning a bus, was costing fifty. Af uh, Africa jet would charge forty five dollars, excluding VAT, of course. If he had VAT, it, it would be somewhere in that region. But if you are in Africa yet, remember they would save you chicken slices as well. So if you take chicken slice, it would come down to around 47, still 45. They would charge $45 from Arari to Vic Force. That was an element of Mishika Shika. Because if you or no flus, if you enter into that plane, you would get the shock of your lives. It was just a combi with a combi which can fly. And you wouldn't complain to say, oh, well, I, I was once in Fly Emirates. What is this? Because that is a no frills. You are in there because it's a low price for low added features. That's no frills. So it is used in this commodity like products, like airplane tickets, where you say, suppose you are in an economy class in some way, in first class, they are having their pools, they are having pool game, pool tables, and they are roasting beef. You can't be saying in a plane, it appears others are busy roasting beef, and here we are just seated. No, because the economy class ticket is a low price for low added features. Whereas in an economy class, you have to, to arrive with your plane, whereas in a business or a first class, you can have a meeting while you're in the plane. So all these are things that we that we have to know. It's not like it's not like um, it's not like it's a bad thing. There are certain businesses which require no free pricing strategy, like the two I've just given you. I've given you two. But there are certain businesses which do not require no frills, where an ability to stoop so low. Remember, embracing no frills when we're that high is called stooping low. When you stoop so low, you can cast an irreparable dent to your reputation. It is fundamentally not feasible with your existing business model. You know, here in Arari, if you get, if you if you go to Cresta Oasis, they are now even selling what is called pub lunch. Uh, it, was it a three star? Is it a two star, three star, or a zero star hotel? I don't even know now. Because of what they are now doing. Normally, it used to be a three star hotel. 
But they then embrace an element of no freeling as a pricing approach. They are, they are now they are now serving pub lunch. So you can buy lunch when you are walking along that Nelson Mandela Road. You can actually pay from over the euro. Say a pub lunch because they have pots all over. Because of COVID, there's social what do you call it? Social distancing. So they have to you can pay from pub lunch or you can get in there and pay it. That is called no freeze. And now if, if you if you are in a three-star hotel and they are buying pub lunch, you you can't expect that pub lunch sudden sell on steak. No, sudden beef bones. Or fowls. You know? Rice and Okay, so you have that. That's what no frills is. I mean, not, if, if not properly managed, it, in Christ Oasis, it's working. Pub lunch, it's working. You can eat in a hotel at lunch at prices which you could afford, which you'd get in any restaurant. That's no frills, but you, do, you, want, you want to get like enough added features to that. But can you imagine if Miku's Hotel, which is a five-star restaurant, wants to embrace no frills? Miku's Hotel saying we are open to pub lunch where you can eat southern beef bones here. Imagine how out of sync with the current business model that approach is. It won't even work. Those who work at Miku's, they will be saying, I work in a five star restaurant. So if they are seeing someone working in chicken in, they don't demean such a person, but they know there are no frills. What they offer is no quality or less added features. So if they see such a one who could just save, cook, or prepare food, the chicken in the person is now at Miku's, you know, you can lose qualified employees if you want to, to do shika shika for your business. You can lose qualified employees. That is called no frills. So there are contexts where no frills works, contexts where no frills doesn't. You must be able to benefit from economies of scale as a result of embracing no frills. Because you are saying, I want to charge a low price. So low price must be compensated by high demand. So if, if your price, if the demand for your price is inelastic, no frills is incompatible as a pricing strategy. So if you are in city center of Harare, you would notice there are various cars which ply city center up on the Parenia and stuff. If you notice, the running water got the same. A four-seater can be stuffed with eight passengers. Eight passengers, and nobody complains. Why? That's a no free. When you board that, you're expecting that. So you can say, oh, we, 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 I thought I was supposed to be one. No. Because no frills is low price, high low value added. So let us write that. I've explained it. I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to managers, so I know who I'm explaining to. So no frills pricing strategy like this. This is a strategy, a strategy ideal for a product, for a product. A product with low quality with low perception of quality, low perception, perception of quality, low perception of quality, of quality, thereby warranting. Thereby warranting a low price. Low price. Low price, low quality. That's 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 no that's no free. Low price, low quality. Low price, low quality. Now conditions, conditions or requirements for no free, no free. Conditions or 
the requirements for non frills can you uh, when you say no right low price no you can give an example you can give an example like eg economy class tickets economy class air tickets economy class air tickets economy class air tickets that's that it, it might be an example that might be an example so what are the conditions or requirements for no frilling you know when we say conditions or requirements we are saying in what way is no frilling suitable so we are saying suitability acceptability acceptability and feasibility of this approach feasibility of this approach because you may be asked the question like evaluate that evaluate no frilling from a strategic perspective an examiner may just say ceo wants you to evaluate no frills as a pricing strategy from a strategic perspective when everything is being evaluated from a strategic perspective we are looking at is that thing acceptable suitable or feasible so it's a matter of now justifying in light of that so uh, you you now have you now have number one you still must have a now fixed cost base the firm must have low fixed cost base as a percentage of total assets low fixed costs as a percentage of total costs your fixed cost must be lower as a percentage of total cost so that you can you have a luxury of reducing price another point is another point is number two Number two is um, the introduction of no frills. The introduction of no frills. No frills must not must not cast an irreparable burn. An an irreparable irreparable dent on the firm's existing reputation on the firm's reputation reputation on quality because it's now no freeze uh, advocates for low quality so make sure whatever you're doing is is not if if if, if your reputation was on producing quality goods, and then you want to do no frills. There's an element of checking whether it's in it's it's it's, it's compatible. Another, it's no frills must be accommodated in the firm's existing business model. No frills must be accommodated. Must must be kept like like this. Must be capable capable of being accommodated in the firm's existing business model in the firm's existing business model that if we can't accommodate no frills in firm in the firm's existing in the existing in the firm's existing business model, then there's a problem somewhere. It must be accommodated. I have to talk to you about what is called business model. Business model is how we, it, the, man, the manner in which we discharge our operations to achieve our mission, how we are structured in terms of our relationship with stakeholders, supply chains and stuff, it's a business model. Do we import raw materials from China? Do we do this? Do we do this, uh, 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 you know, assemble them into a final product. What, what is it that we do? We call that business model, how we deliver our stated objectives. So suppose you are part of a value network. You remember value network. I said 
a supply chain consisting of firms which undertake value chain analysis. We call that a value network. Now, let, let us say you are part of a value network. You have made commitment to, do, to pursue value chain analysis amongst your operations. And then suddenly you want to embrace no frills. A, a, an approach which, casts, which does not put much emphasis on quality. That's no frills. Pub lunch, I was talking about pub lunch before now, where you, you a five-star restaurant would say, we now want to open a pub lunch where someone just walk in and eat $2 lunch is yet the normal lunch price is 70 US. And then you want to stoop to the no frills. At times, it, you may end up losing even qualified employees. You may end up even losing your supply chain partners. Because if they associate with you, their reputation may be damaged by virtue of association with you. So it's important. So if you, if you can't synchronize it in your existing business model, it, 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 it won't be ideal under the circumstances. All right? Another is, the firm must benefit from economies of scale following reduction in price. must benefit economies of scale following a reduction following a reduction in price following a reduction in price together that's no frills pricing strategy. In other words, you can open brackets and then price elasticity of demand must be, must be elastic. Must be elastic. Another is, another is the market must be competitive. Suitable for a competitive market. Suitable for a suitable for a competitive market. It's suitable for a competitive market. That's no fruits. You know, Elon Musk, that Tesla, they are they want to to come up with a, a robot a, a rocket which can engage in space tourism, launching people to space as tourists. You can't advise them to do no frills because that market is less competitive. They actually charge 20 million per trip or 50 million or 100 million or billion depending on specification. So you can see that you can't advise such for no frills. All right. And then hybrid strategies. Hybrid strategies. That's number number five. Number number five. Hybrid strategies. Now, hybrid strategies. We we have spoken to these as combination of those. You know, these strategies may may actually work in a complementary capacity. These strategies may actually work in a complementary capacity, and you need to understand that. They may work in a complementary capacity and they cover quite a lot. If you want them to work in a complementary capacity, you can have, e.g., it's a, combi a combination of any of the above. So let us actually just have an example because it's no longer something new, but it's a combination. You can have what is called forecast differentiation, e.g., forecast differentiation. Forecast differentiation. You know, by forecast differentiation, you are combining forecast and differentiation. So what you are doing is you are choosing a market that's forecast, and then you want to be unique and preemptive in that one market that's forecast differentiation. The firm intends to be to, to, have, to, to be unique and preemptive in its chosen market. Some may have low cost focus, low cost focus. What do we mean by low cost focus? We are saying 
after identifying a market segment, we want to be a low cost in that market. So it's a hybrid strategy. Now I've, I've taught you quite a lot of things. And now you may ask a, a, a logical question and say, say, suppose I have my business, which strategy really works? Which strategy, if you want to know which strategies are likely to work and others which are, which are unlikely to work, you compare price you are charging against quality of your product. You know, I'm referring again to quality, to value creation. You comp For you to know which, which strategy is likely to work, just you have two of these variables, right? Compare price you are charging against the customer's perception of quality. If customers perceive that there is no quality, clearly, clearly, why bother? If customers perceive that quality of output is very low, why bother? That's the question. So I want to show you, we call it according to Porter, you know, these guys with, according to Porter with, um, with, with 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 his strategies he came up with what is called strategic clock strategic clock analysis strategic clock let me let me show you how it works i i, I we are not going to draw it i'm explaining it from the board uh, all right i have just opened open to one here if I, if I can save it so that I can, I can open it nicely as a picture here it's not opening properly there are various strategic clocks you can have a strategic clock for yourself to say if I pursue this it will work okay it's opening Right. Okay. Okay, it's opening again. Just wait. Right. So here you are. That's a strategic clock. Notice perceived value to the customer. I like the choice of words. Please, I want you to be directors. Never underestimate the choice of words here. It is value not from what you are clamoring to be offering, but what customers are seeing. So strategies which are likely to fail, strategies which are likely to fail. If you if you go by strategy six, seven, and eight, if we, if if I am to circle these, these strategies clearly are likely to fail. These ones, strategy six, seven, and eight, these ones, these ones, they are likely to fail because you are charging a high price with low perceived quality. So in a competitive market, they are likely to fail, but in a monopoly like number seven, if it's monopoly, you you can still be successful but if a market becomes combat competitive and you are going by six seven and eight you are in danger now there is no frills law law here we have we have discussed the conditions for no frills to be appropriate so if you if you really want to if you really want to be to, 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 to be cool in the market, I'd advise these ones. Three and three and two, especially three, which is low price but high quality and it's a hybrid. But if you want to be standalone but still making quite a lot of money and while customers are also happy. This one is ideal. This is normally what Apple uses, focused differentiation. Or Apple normally 
uses this category. It's between these. It's either differentiation or leaning towards forecast. It is within this range, Apple. Charge, it charges a high price, but it's making a lot of money also because customers are perceiving iPhones to be of high quality. You get that? So notice, you, it's a matter of being given a case study for you to know which one to use. So if you have a company and you want to know, say, it taught me about how I can compete in the market segment. I now want to apply what I've been taught. Use this clock. You know, you know the perception of quality that your customers have. You know, if, if you are in a position where, for example, a customer, you, suppose you are in a position where a customer cannot give you $10 without meeting you face to face, you still know that customers, they still need to verify. They still need to verify. Others are being given orders for, suppose you supply chicken, poultry, beds, the slaughtered chicken. They are being given orders for 500 beds without even meeting the, 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 the farmer. So, meaning such a farmer now has reached a stage where perception of quality in, in the minds of customer is now established. So the customer can just say, I need 400 beds. I need this. But if perception of quality is still low, that is a key determinant. And when you're saying perception, it's not like how you perceive it, but how customers perceive it. So important. Okay, so you can see, say talks and talks and talks quite a lot, quite a lot. Uh, what we want to discuss next is what is called change management. Change management, it's, a, it's actually a new topic. Change management, I gave you program of study and I'm sure you have you have program of start with you. If you don't have that, you get it from your colleagues. Or if I can locate it close uh, here with me, I can as well send it. Let me see. This is program of study. It guides us as to how we are going to revise these topics, guys. So you can see here, we are now on change management. So we say the strategic position, environment, strategic choices, change management. This is not how these are, exam are, are actually given in the assignment. Now notice, after we, now that we are on item number four, we are now going to give you assignments. So these assignments here are based on all these topics, all these topics. They, we, we are going to give you these assignments. So you, 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 you get you get requests from uh, Grace, our administrator. She will be asking you to provide her with information that you that she will have to load on what is called CBE practice platform. Your exam is computer based, so what it means is when we give you the assignments, you do it in a in a software or platform which directly mimics your exam environment. It mirrors your exam environment. You get that? And now, when that when it comes to assignments, I, are you not seeing we are supposed to be 11 in this class, but only three have joined, meaning others are relying on the fact that they shall play the video. When it comes to assignments now, if you don't do the assignments, you will receive a notification from the admin. If you don't do any two consecutive assignments, you'll be disqualified from being a student at Atlantis. And that 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 not work out in your favor because at Atlantis we take passing seriously. We have a record we have to maintain. There's a record we established which we have to maintain. And if we realize that you are a no frills, <laughs> you might not be compatible with our business model. I'm joking. I'm just trying to for you to, to, to know. Make sure you will be receiving messages from Grace, our administrator this week. She will be inquiring, she will be requesting information on the CBE practice platform. This is the platform which is exactly the same platform you will be using to answer CBE exams in June. 
We don't want a situation where you get to the exam and then begin to to to, to uh, discover or to investigate how the software works, how to type, how to copy paste, or how a, a presentation slide is like. No, no. We don't want to wait till then. That is the purpose of the assignment. So make sure that by Saturday you would have received, or Sunday latest, you, let's put Monday latest, you would have received your assignment. You will receive the assignments in your email from test reach. Actually, what I will do is I will send a video. Uh, I will send a video to you in, uh, telling you how you receive the assignment. But the long and short of it is you will receive an assignment not from Atlas resources, but from test reach. This is the firm contracted by IACCA to administer CBE assignments. It is test rich. That's the one you use on your CBE practice platform. So once you receive, you 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 be given an initial password. You then have to log in to you log in into the platform. And when the platform asks you to choose a learning provider, don't choose ACCA. You have to select Atlens because you are learning at Atlens. So you shall receive assignments from Atlens, not from ACCA. Though all the assignments we give you are from a CCA material because being licensed, we can't necessarily come up with, though we come up with ours from time to time, but we take strong uh, inclination towards get using the available material. So our research, you may say, in what way is the assignment different from BPP revision kit and stuff? As your tutor, I have already done a lot of things to discover questions with high examinative content. I've already done that on your behalf. So if I choose an assignment question, I now know it slices through quite a lot of discuss, quite a lot of learning outcomes. With that task, you might not be able to do it as a student. Because to you, you may spend two hours learning an item which is just focusing on, say, Porter's five forces. And when we give you a two hour assignment, we know it focuses on it quite a lot. So we have done that for you. Above all, I have purchased a question bank. I have sent it here in our WhatsApp group. Make sure you have it. Make sure you have it and things will work out right for us all. Okay. Uh, continuing. Now, oh, oh, let us, oh, actually for today, for today, I, 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 I'm feeling I can't, I can't join change management with this lesson because this lesson is quite enough on its own. For today, allow me to end our lecture early because what you have learned is quite a lot. Let me now prepare the issue of giving you assignments. You, you now, Colin, you now have question bank and notes from me. Remember, these are my notes. Let me open, let me open them and show you. I, I'm giving you notes just because I know some of you, I, I know you may not understand it because these are theory. Application is what you are here for and your exam is about application. So because of that, that's what I'm giving you notes for, to equip you with the skills to apply. So the password, as I said, is 2Z05AR. That's your password. So notice, these are the notes. Notice how many pages? 229 typed pages. I'm the one who typed this. So you so you have quite a lot. Quite a lot. You will not you will not come across such material and fail. You can't. It's not possible. It's not possible. Even if you are destined to fail, the odds are now being pivoted. You have you ever heard what are known as inverse odds? They are it's now inverse of the odds now. I, I, they are succinct, meaning brief and to the point. And they are articulate, meaning they cover ten essentials to the, to the extent that you'll be able to know them. All right, so all these. This lecture here is the explanation of these notes. Get that? So 
governance. Notice I started with governance and the risk because this is these are things you already know from earlier chapters. Notice you may say say you're not to start with governance and the risk, but you started with something else because those ones, those topics, they don't have value for money. You 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 actually can't pay me for school fees. And I be, I then begin to teach you about internal controls. How do you what are internal controls? They are to ensure that there is reliability in financial repeating, efficiency and effectiveness in firms' operations to help prevent and detect fraud and error. You learn that in audit. We still require that. I typed the notes on that. Type the, net, the notes on that also. What are the composition of an audit committee? What are the requirements for a director to be an independent, non-executive director? What, 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 what do we mean by balanced board? What are the duties? and composition of the remuneration committee, of the nominations committee. What are the duties of the risk committee for the board? Read that. We shall discuss that. On the program of study, you can see, we left, we, 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 we have demoted them to the last two lectures. There are just two lectures we need for that. But I, I know by the time I get there, you've already read everything. And now, because I want you to practice, I don't want to, I don't want a situation where I wait until then and you haven't practiced anything. That's the reason for the question bank. I, 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 I then came up with the question bank in a manner, which is in a manner that we are seeing in the notes. Where's the question bank? Here. This is the question bank. This one is, is up, it, it, it's born deep down to the marrow material you needed. Born deep, because have you ever had such, can you admit and talk to me? Have you ever had born deep down to the marrow material? Uh, no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a born deep down to the marrow material that you needed. You can't you 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 can't say say uh, where did you get this never no don't worry it's just to you know that say is given me bone deep down to the marrow material so this is question bank all these are selected questions we have given you links as to where you can get some of the questions the ACCA links because when you are doing this. So questions with, with the questions we started with are, are to do with governance and the risk. Governance and risk, non, uh, not for profit entities, public sector entities, quite a lot of things there. You now know this. I want you to do the assignment so that we revise the assignment and give you another assignment, we revise it and give you another assignment and we revise it and so forth. And when we are revising, like an appraisal of the importance of internal controls in CSC and other care service provider. A proposal recommending suitable internal control changes, which would help address the service delivery failures described in the case. Like how which internal controls can we have? Suppose there were thefts, cash was stolen, there was bribe, the production manager was seen bribing a minister or people from the department from the ministry, a health inspector. How then do you put in place internal controls for that? You need, all this is on governance and risk. So you'll be doing all this, and when you're doing these questions, when you're doing these questions, like here, this is no longer on governance and risk, it's now on environment. Analyze macro environmental factors affecting scored light bulb industry. Assess the competitive nature of the scored light bulb industry. You know that here you use Potter's five forces. Macro, that's pastel factors. Critically evaluate the proposal to the, 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 uh, evaluate the potential acquisition of fleet by lead. You use suitability, acceptability, and feasibility. I, I told you that. Discuss appropriateness of entering into a strategic partnership rather than in acquisition, meaning what, what are the in what way is it appropriate to enter into a partnership as compared to acquisition? All these are now beginning to make sense. Notice these questions. 
Why am I opening them for you to, to I am developing hunger in you? Prepare a report to the board which evaluates current performance and contribution of each of the three current operating companies in Rome group portfolio and assess their relative significance in its future strategy. Here, I said you use either BCG matrix or Ashridge model. So all you have to do is to read the case for you to understand which model to use. Is it BCG matrix? Is it Ashridge model? Play the previous week's video to know the factors you consider for you to know is do I use BCG on this one or do I use Ashridge? Critically evaluate proposal, proposed acquisition of Godiva Airport. That's suitability, acceptability, and feasibility. And then there is draft a letter to say Jones what the CEO of Rome, which discusses how both elements of this route to competitive advantage, meaning low price and product differentiation. Low price and low product differentiation is a hybrid strategy, might be achieved by Stuart Rome. You get that? Now it's high time you begin to like this. It's high time you clearly begin to like this. Another question is, assess using both financial and non-financial measures the attractiveness from SWIFT perspective of EVM as an acquisition target. That, that is called acceptability and feasibility. That's what they want. Analyze the national competitiveness of a, a, a curia, meaning this one is a nation. When it's a nation, you use Potter's diamond model. Told you that. I told you that. You get that? Oh, what else can I say, guys? We are beginning to like it. We are beginning to like it. Let me end here. I've done a lot of work on this one. This is a holy grail, born deep down to the marrow relevant material that you need. Cheers, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. We will, we will then we will then meet again on change management. Bye. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, Cole.